Thank you so much, everyone. I want to start by thanking B-Sides London for welcoming us here. Thank you to the sponsors, the organizers, and of course, to you all for coming along and listening to Kevin and myself talk about building a champions program in an organization. We're going to cover what a cybersecurity champions program is, how you build one, why they are a good idea, uh, what you can do to engage people, keep them motivated. We're going to talk about some ideas of how to measure whether your champions program is going well or not, and uh, some of the pitfalls, some of the things that can go wrong. Um, so we're going to try and cover you know, a nice introduction to champions. There'll be some time at the end for questions. So whether you have never heard of a champions program, whether you are thinking of running one, whether you're running one already, hopefully there'll be something that you take away uh, from what Kevin and I have to say today to help you. So uh, to start, we're going to introduce ourselves. Yeah. Well, as you can see, this is us, all right? <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. I've worked for Hargreaves Lansdowne for about two and a half years now. I am the cyber risk manager. Uh, use formerly information security. I actually changed the job title just because cyber is a little bit more sexier to use as a, as a name, right? Um, and the reason why we're doing this is because when you look at defense, technology only goes part of the way. Because let's face it, phishing emails are the easiest way to breach any organization, right? Or is that debatable? Okay, you got agreement. So, Jess, you want to say a little yeah, bit about yourself? Yeah, so I've spoken at B-Sides London a few times, um, but if you're not familiar with me, I'm one of the co-founders of Sygenta, together with FC, and um, I'm talking about this because my work is always on the human side of cybersecurity, so generally working on awareness raising, behavioral change, cultural issues around cybersecurity in organizations, and I've worked with a few clients who either were establishing a new champions program or looking to have a more successful champions program. And so Kevin and I, we share this interest in culture, in champions, and decided to come and share some of the stuff that we've learned with you all today. Cool. So a little bit of background uh, on Hargreaves Lansdowne, as this is a bit of a case study. So Hargreaves Lansdowne is Britain's number one private investment supermarket, if you like. Okay, it was started in around about 1981 by two friends in a bedroom, and the business grew very, very, very quickly. Um, we have around about a million clients with almost 100 billion pounds of assets under management. I do sleep at night, all right? I don't panic <laughs> with that. Um, the point of telling you this is that Hargreaves grew so quickly there was a lot of work to do, I felt, when I got there two and a half years ago. And I felt tackling this in a traditional way would not have worked. So engagement with people in the organization and building a team of champions was something that I embarked on, which I worked together with Jess on. And we see this a lot um, at Sygenta. A lot of our clients will have grown really quickly. And so they're trying to think about how they manage culture, how they communicate effectively with people, how they um, try and encourage positive behavioral change. So Sygenta, I uh, run together with FC, and we work on the human, the technical, and the physical sides of cybersecurity. Uh, we like to say that our main sort of areas of work are like the three T's. So we do testing, physical, technical, and cultural assessments. We do training, all sorts of different types of training. We do lots of speaking about cybersecurity as well. Aside from this, we do lots of other stuff. And as I've already said, one of the things that I've helped some of our clients with is building these champion programs, making sure that they're effective. So we're talking about champion programs today. And you may have a question, what is a champions program? Um, just a quick show of hands. Who runs or who has a champions program running in their organization? Okay, good few of you. Wonderful. All right. So from my perspective, what is Cyber Champions Program? It's made up of your most loyal staff, your biggest fans, and they're very, very helpful. They want to be part of security for whatever reason, whatever their motivations are. Um, 
One of the things I don't do is hold back when it comes to my champions. I want them involved, okay? So, yes, my boss, I report to the CISO for Hargreaves, which makes things handy when I need to get something signed off, get some money. Um, but I get them sitting with him, shadowing for the day, all right? They get involved with the physical security guys. If I've got my PCI DSS auditor on, I'll bring them in and get them involved. Let them see exactly how it operates. Get them to understand the reason why it's important to have everybody understanding their remit and security. Um, for the SOC, we have a SOC in Hargreaves. I get the guy sitting with the SOC for maybe a few hours of the day. Um, if there's any type of incidents or red team or purple team, I get them involved to a point. And I also get them involved in penetration testing. So we've also got risk and we work with fraud. So there's quite a few teams. And what I want them to do is have an appreciation and understanding of how the teams connect. And also having the champions, they're made up of different people. They're just like me and you, okay? But everybody's got a slightly different interest. So I open up the doors. So it's not just information security. They can get involved in any part of the system. And I think it's a great way of doing that at Hargreaves because the champions generally in an organization will be people, as Kevin has said, who have an interest in security for one reason or another. So with clients that have never had a champions program before or people who've never come across the term, the way I like to describe it is a bit like kind of thinking of health and safety and your health and safety representatives throughout an organization. It's just the same, but with cybersecurity. So I've found in some clients, it'll be people who ask the questions of the security team, people who report a lot of incidents, people who want to know more about personal security and they're asking some advice on that. They're all people that can make great champions. I've also found in a couple of clients, people who um, have actually found security difficult and who have complained about security, they actually can turn into great champions because they're people who want to engage. And if you can get them to engage as champions, Champions, they're usually really good at then going ahead and kind of flying the flag for security. Absolutely. Um, so one interest that Kevin and I really share is around culture. And we want to talk a little bit about culture because the Champions Program can be really effective in positively influencing the security culture of an organization. So culture is one of those terms that uh, can sound a little bit woolly, but we're hearing a lot about culture over the last year in terms of security. If you're not that familiar with, you know, working with cultures, um, culture in general is basically a way of life. It is the customs, the beliefs, usually of a, a particular group in society. And usually those cultures are represented through rituals, through art, through customs, through food. When it comes to organizational culture, um, there's been loads of studies of organizational culture, what that means, what it looks like. And essentially, organizational culture can be understood as the values and beliefs that underpin the behaviors of people in your organization. So the culture is kind of something that emerges through how people behave, which is based on what they believe is the right thing, the right way to be. And organizational culture is really influential when it comes to security in all sorts of ways. For example, if you have a culture of fear, where people are particularly punished, you know, if they click on a link or if there's an incident involving them and information security. If you have that kind of culture of fear where people are very worried about security, then what you're going to see is people hiding incidents, people not reporting stuff. So culture and security are really important. Everything from how technical controls are implemented through to things like reporting of incidents, you're going to see a huge impact on how security operates coming from the culture that you have around cybersecurity. And so culture is really important because it can influence, you know, how you bring about change programs when it comes to security. It influences your development cycle and whether security is built into that, whether there's good communications between the teams, um, and the, to the extent that you have insider incidents and to the extent that you know about them, the extent to which they're reported. Oh, oh, oh. 
got a bit think, click happy there. Sorry, Kevin. That's all right. So following on from what Jess said, um, cultures take um, time to change, and you can measure it in months, probably years it takes to change mindsets. Um, but what's the point? What's the point in having security champions? I think having security champions enables a two-way conversation. So you can get metrics from anywhere in the business and try and measure the successes of what you do. But we're in an industry which is very, very difficult to quantify. So we don't produce widgets. All we do is ask for money and we say, can we have X amount? And then the response is, well, what are we getting for our money? What are you spending it on? Well, you won't get a breach. Okay? So it's that constant battle asking for money and trying to understand where the value is. Having a champions program really does help you do that. You get good feedback because you get an aggregated view from the business exactly what the business perceives security to be. Whether it's negative, whether it's positive, and those issues can be highlighted depending on where the areas that the champions sit. And we'll go into that a little bit more in just a while. Um, but it's clear, it's really key to understand that they're not the police. You know, you want to get these guys operating at an effective level where they just seamlessly blend in, you know, and I think that's really, really important just to get the right results out of it as well. It's such an important point. I've seen some people who think, oh, great, we'll have a champions program because then we'll have people out there who can tell on everyone else and who can report back. <laughs> And that's not really the way that you want to approach it. It should be about having a healthy culture and being able to listen, as, as Kevin has said. Um, often people feel like communications from information security go one way, you know, and that they're often told what to do with security. Um, this way, having a champions program, you're giving people a voice, you're, you're giving them a face in their department, someone they can go to with their concerns, with their questions, with their worries. And that is a really healthy message to send that we as information security are listening to the business. It also is a really great way of scaling up what you're trying to do in information security. So it's a question I commonly get. Organizations that maybe don't have a lot of resource when it comes to cybersecurity, you know, don't have big teams, find it very difficult to get their messages out there. One great thing to do is to think about a champions program because there you're really being able to um, amplify your messages. You have people out there in the business who know the business, who are known to their colleagues, who can take forward your messages and relay them to the people around them. So it's a fantastic way of being able to scale up. And for me, it taps really effectively into the notion of social proof. So social proof, if people have seen my presentations before, you might have heard me talk about it. But social proof is basically the idea that we mimic behavior that we see from other people. So if, for example, there's, there's been a study, University of Pennsylvania, and they recently found that if 25% of a group start behaving in a particular way, the rest of the group are very likely to follow and mimic that behavior. So if a quarter of you get up and walk out the room now, Kevin and I are basically going to be talking to ourselves. <laughs> or more likely, we're going to follow as well. Because, <laughs> because it's kind of human nature to think, oh, they they must know something that I don't. They must know the schedule better than me. Maybe they've heard a fire alarm. Maybe, you know, there's some reason why that percentage of people are all behaving in a particular way. I'm going to follow. So that's social proof. And social proof is most effective when the person modeling the behavior is someone we admire or we can relate to. So by having people out in the business as champions, um, you've got people out there that colleagues recognize, that they relate to, you know, they know the work that they're doing, they're familiar. And so you're kind of tapping into that idea of social proof as a way of really scaling up and amplifying your messages. And this idea of culture that we've been talking about, as I said, I've, I've heard more and more about this uh, in the industry over the last couple of years, which has been absolutely fantastic to see people starting to recognize the importance of security culture. 
One thing I do is I'm the chair of an organization called Club CISO. We're a members group, non-commercial, um, about 200 uh, information security leaders in the UK, in Europe and beyond are members of Club CISO. And one thing we do is we get the CISOs together, about 60 of them every year, and we ask questions of them. The results are all anonymous, and it's a way of us just finding out what's happening in cybersecurity from that group's perspective. So one question we always ask them is, what are the hot topics on your radar? And this year, this was, this was the question, these were the possible answers, and we saw an overwhelming majority picking security culture as the number one hot topic for them. The thing that they, by a hot topic, we mean something that they're starting to think about, something they're aware that they should be working on, their priorities for the coming year. So we can see that culture is really important um, to CISOs, it's really important to the security industry, and a champions program is a great way of trying to influence culture in a positive way. So, quick show of hands, who has something like this, a cybersecurity day which runs annually in their organization? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, so a few of you. For the ones that don't, it's brilliant. Because what it does is it promotes information security, cybersecurity, whatever you want to call it, security. It promotes it. All right? It brings it into the limelight. And this is where I get my champions to show off their wares. Okay, So they get involved with the planning, the running of the event. We do all sorts of stuff, okay? It, we, we run several different stations with different games, and the guys will man the stations, do some password cracking, lock picking, uh, phishing email tests, have I been pwned, um, and all sorts of different cybersecurity days. Um, and they also get involved with the distribution of material. Now, I have around about 60 to 80 champions at the moment. They are spread quite evenly amongst the business. So where we've got a call center, there's probably a higher population, but we've got a small detail of about 10 people in the finance team. We've probably got one or two, uh, for example. So they represent their areas. And getting them to hand out things like these little badges, which is the things I want them to focus on, right? Um, wear your badge. Don't click malicious links, all right? Use your Windows key and L for locking. Figure out what the objectives are and the requirements for your organization and get them out there. It gives them really, really good presence in the business. It shows the business the value that they're getting out of security functions. So rather than just being a figure on the payroll, they're actually adding value by leveraging the other people in their department. And it also gives them that familiarity. So in terms of conveying messages, your champions can convey and convert the message to language that your, the local team will understand rather than you just speaking in tech terms all the time. The fantastic thing about Champions Programs is you can make this model fit according to the resources you have, the kind of organization you have, your requirements, and what you want to get out of it. So there's completely different models depending on the context and your particular organization. Depending on your budget, there's all sorts of different things you can do. And I've seen this approach taken in organizations that have really small security teams and really limited budgets through to organizations that have really large security teams and a fantastic, really healthy budget to play with. There's lots of different things that you can do. Some of the benefits are that you will engage with your champions to build threat models and help you to understand, you know, the kind of threats that the different parts of the organization are facing. You can have champions involved in security reviews, in research and development. I have seen some organizations have champion programs that are very kind of bug bounty heavy um, and that have kind of a, a hack the organization kind of approach. Um, one approach that I've seen really successful in organizations that have a limited budget is a train the trainer one. So essentially you, you know, if you have a really small team and you have um, very limited constraints around raising awareness, then you have one person in the security team who trains some of the champions, trains them not only in kind of some security material, but also how to deliver that, how you want it delivered. And then those champions go on and train 
other champions, and it's almost like a waterfall kind of tree effect where you're building on top of um, each other in terms of the network. It's a really good way of developing best practice, enhancing decision making, you know, making sure you're listening to the business, lots of different things that you can do with your champions program depending on the needs. So I've said there's lots of different approaches. Some approaches will um, make being a champion kind of part of somebody's job description and will actually pay them for it. Others, it won't be part of the job description, and this is more common. It will be something that people take on in kind of a volunteer capacity. And these approaches have pros and cons. You know, obviously, if you're able to make it part of somebody's job description, if people are able to get paid for it, then that's really good in terms of recruiting people. Um, it can be more attractive to some people. It's something that people feel more comfortable with because it's part of their job description. You know, they know they're going to have the time for it. It's something official. But they may not be intrinsically motivated. You know, these are people who are doing it because they're getting paid, because it's, you know, it's part of their time, it's part of their job description. So that's a good thing, but it has the limitation sometimes in terms of whether they genuinely want to be doing it. If you're not able to pay people, which is more common, and if you're asking people to volunteer for this position, then it can be harder to recruit people, but certainly not impossible. Um, but the people that you do get signing up to be champions are doing it because they want to, you know, because they're really motivated. So engaging with those individuals and sort of long-term retention of those people is going to be stronger. So depending on your options, there's pros and cons, um, and there's no one size fits all. There's no necessarily right or wrong way of doing this. It's just about understanding what's right for you and for your organization. Cool. So in terms of recruitment, and actually establishing the process from scratch, that's pretty much it. And you can find this on OWASP, okay? Um, being heavily regulated in a heavily regulated industry, um, we've got FCA, GDPR, PCIDSS, yada, yada, yada. It's really, really key for us to make sure we're training people and giving awareness um, throughout the year. And what I've done is I've mandated that information security um, actually does the induction or is part of the initial first day induction. That also puts emphasis on the importance of security. So, you know, within the morning, within an hour, these new recruits are engaging with me. And guess what? This is a perfect time for me to pitch. So I talk about all the activities that we do as a collective in security. And I try and make it sound really interesting and exciting. And what I often get at the end of that is someone going, can, can I hear a little bit more? And that's my recruitment process. Now, to establish it, obviously I've got people who have been there for a while. I spoke to senior management, they backed the idea and actually asked some of the directors to become security champions. Some of those positions were delegated. But what I did achieve was a really good mix of people throughout the business to represent each and every department. So you cannot walk into my company without seeing a champion somewhere in one of the teams that you can refer to. Um, so the first thing in terms of identifying, for me, I like to go all out. So I have, like I said, somebody in each department. And then defining the actual role. Well, what, what is it you're trying to achieve? I always ask that question. So sometimes people can have champions for champions' sake, but there's going to come a point where you need to keep maintaining that relationship and that interest. So it's really important to have your objectives set it out in the terms of reference so that people understand exactly what they're getting, engage with their managers and support them to do their jobs, and get them to understand that this is just part of their job and not additional, because nobody wants extra work to do, do they? All right? At least I don't know anyway. Um, and nominate the actual champions as well. So how do I identify them? Well, I've already mentioned recruiting, but who do you talk to amongst your different peer groups throughout the business that talk in that language? Who shows more interest and wants to engage with you? Are you having those conversations with them to understand whether they want to join the team? Have you had people apply for jobs and not been successful? Those are also really good candidates to look at. 
And then you have to look at your communications channel. Because if I'm honest with you, none of this stuff is just straightforward and easy. Okay? Everybody has a different job to do. They're working at different times. They prefer to communicate in different ways. And you have to kind of understand that. So we use wikis. We use emails. We use Confluence pages. We use all sorts of different ways to communicate. We also have team meetings. I'll do lunch and learns. To be honest with you, I, there's not much I wouldn't do for my champions because in showing that time and commitment is really important to invest. Um, as I've said about the wiki pages, having a really strong knowledge base. Now, you may have people in your business that want to become a champion but don't necessarily have the confidence because they think it's too technical. I don't want to get involved. I don't understand IT. Actually... Try and simplify it for them and give them that confidence because what do you really need them to do? Report back on any issues, problem areas that you want to target, things that you want to fix in the organization. So try and understand exactly what you're trying to achieve. All right? And maintaining the interest. So you do all the hard work and then you get to a point where it almost becomes boring. And what are you going to do? Let's have another champions meeting again. Right. Who's found a breach or how many breaches in your, try and make it a little bit more dynamic and actually have your team become, you can have a little core team of champions. Let them suggest what activities to do. I do different things so I can bring champions to conferences. They get involved with penetration tests, like I said, and get them sitting amongst the different teams as well. And we have a different calendar of events. So we bring in guest speakers. We do lunch and learns. We do all different types of things just to keep up the level of interest. And then ask them. Ask them if they're getting bored. Ask them if they want to do something different. And put it on the table and just have that constant two-way dialogue so you've got a really rich relationship. So... This isn't me, by the way. <laughs> These are the champions. As I've said, often you are um, finding people as champions who aren't going to be financially rewarded for taking on this role. And so then you're thinking about how to engage and motivate people who are taking on this responsibility on top of what they already do. So you're looking for people who have an interest in security. I, doing a lot of awareness raising for clients, I often find people will come at the end of a session and ask questions about personal security. So they'll ask me about, you know, they're worried if their Gmail's been hacked, if their Instagram's been hacked, they're worried about their kids, they're wondering how they can stay safe at home. And these people are ideal for being champions because they're individuals who, you know, they're not experts in security. That's not what you're looking for for a champion. They're people who are motivated to find out more. They're interested in finding out more. And they've got an intrinsic reason for wanting to be a champion. If you're a champion, you know, you're going to be exposed, as, as Kevin said, to more learning. You're going to be finding out more about security. And then you're able to take that away and apply it at home. So, finding the people who are interested in security for whatever reason, whether it is people who are interested because of their personal lives, people who maybe are thinking about transferring to security at some point in their career, people who have been involved in incidents and they've had their eyes opened as to how important security is. These are all people who you may want to follow up with and say, you know, would you be interested in being a champion and having this opportunity to learn a bit more and get a bit more experience about cybersecurity? It's really important to keep people engaged, as Kevin has said, to make sure that people feel that they're rewarded, that they're welcomed, that they're included. I think we're in a fantastic opportunity with cybersecurity in general, and particularly with champions, in that awareness of this subject has never been higher. In the news, people are constantly being confronted with stories of data breaches, vulnerabilities, um, you know, cyber attacks that are happening on companies. We're having companies talk about this stuff more and more internally. We're seeing cybersecurity as, you know, su subjects in mainstream TV programs and films. So people are aware of security in a way that they weren't even a few years ago. And this means that people are more interested in it. They just don't know where to go, don't know how to find out more. So try and tap into that higher level of awareness and interest in security by approaching people about being champions. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a carrot. Okay, so how do you motivate these champions? I think one of the most important things is just simply to thank them for their efforts because thanks goes a long way for some people. They don't need much more than that. But a little bit of recognition for the efforts as well. So send an email. Take the time out to just drop an email to their line managers and let them know their engagement's been appreciated and it's actually done some good as well. Um, company recognition. So Amazon vouchers don't cost too much. If you've got some budget, figure out some things and rewards that you can give to your champions. Um, I'd be really interested to hear some of the ideas that you guys have as well. Um, so giving away goodies um, and just having that chat amongst themselves and communicating issues that they have is also really, really good. Um, anything you could think of? Just yeah, in terms I of heard a, a really cool thing, actually. I was over in the States last year and I went to a conference that was all about kind of awareness, particularly in higher education in terms of cybersecurity. And I was chatting to a guy there who runs a champion program for a university. It's a university in the States that has a lot of money. Um, but what they do was sounded really cool. Every quarter, um, he sends out a box of kind of champion goodies um, to the champions. And it has in the kind of stuff that Kevin was talking about earlier, you know, like maybe a poster or some flyers of the latest kind of security messages, um, some kind of giveaways and things that they want to distribute out to the organization. So these get sent every quarter to the champions. And what this guy does to make it kind of a little bit more interesting, he was a sort of larger than life character, had a lot of personality, really fun guy. And so he films videos of him packing up the box and puts them on the kind of intranet for the champions to see. And he said that the champions respond really well to that, that it's almost like Christmas every quarter where they get to see him like packing up this box and like, oh, here's the next post it's going in um, and kind of making it sort of a whole fun thing so they're amped and they're ready to receive this box full of goodies that they're then excited about distributing out to people so I think I think you also spoke about some really good stuff earlier about bringing in external speakers kind of giving your champions um, some exclusive content if they're people who are interested in security then giving them a little bit of extra learning as you said bringing them along to a conference asking them if they want to maybe do a certification, if they want to actually get a qualification in security, and maybe you're able to support them in that. Something that just offers them a little bit of extra learning and helps add to their CV, their professional development, or support them in security at home. Yeah. I think they're all great ways. Exactly. And I think one of the other things is not to forget exactly what you want these champions to achieve for you. So share the successes of what you're asking them to do. If you've had a reduction in, in breach notifications or report or an increase in reported fishes because people are taking more notice of the emails, then tell them that. Let them know they're actually making a difference because that's why they're with you in the first place. So I think that's really, really key. Yeah, I think that's actually the most important point because champions are going to be people that want to have a positive impact. And so being able to communicate them to them that they're achieving that is going to be one of the most important things of actually keeping them engaged. We're all busy people and your champions knowing that actually them spending the time committing to this is actually working, then I think what better reward can you yeah. give them but than that? Absolutely. I've seen some other organizations do kind of special champion mascots and they've had the champions like pick the mascot themselves yeah. and then that mascot will go on to like mugs, t-shirts, whatever it might be, stickers. And that's quite a fun way of kind of building up that team dynamic, I guess. Um, so goodies are a good thing, but I think the rewards um, in terms of achievement and in terms of feedback to people's line managers, that's probably going to be even more yeah, effective than goodies. So, speaking of being effective, how do you measure whether the champions are working, whether it's a successful thing to do? Because obviously this is going to be taking up your time, it's going to be taking up their time, and people always want to know, you know, how are we measuring security and what's actually working? One of the key things to do, of course, is checking in with your champions, making sure you're trying to have regular conversations with them. It keeps them interested, but also it's a way of hearing back from them. What's working? What's not? What support do they need that maybe you're not providing at that time? Also, 
When you have a champions program, as Kevin said earlier, it's thinking about, well, what behaviors in the organization do you want to influence? If you identify those behaviors and then you shape your communications around those, I would highly recommend doing a measurement of those behaviors before the champion program starts or before they start concentrating on your particular issues and then do a measurement after it's been rolling for some time. So thinking about the behaviors you want to see change and then measuring whether that actually happens is going to be the best ways of getting that feedback. There's lots of different ways. People often think kind of the human side, awareness, behavior, culture, that's really hard to measure. And that's not true. That's a myth. There are lots of things you can do to measure whether your awareness initiatives are working, whether behavioral change is happening, whether you're developing a more um, successful security culture. There's plenty of things out there that you can do. If you want to talk to me about how we do that at Sygenta, then I'm happy to talk about that after this presentation. Um, but other things you can do, of course, is look at your incident reporting. If you see your incident reports go up after you've started a champions program, then I would say that's a really good sign. Um, it's not that you're having more incidents. Of course, it is that the champions are facilitating the feeding back of those incidents. What you're seeing is a positive change in your culture where people feel more able to identify incidents or more able to report them. And that's really effective. Cool. Pitfalls. Does anyone remember this game or am I showing my age? Hey. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I actually bought an Atari the other day, an old one. But anyway, that's something different. There are lots of pitfalls with this. Um, and just going back to Jesse's comment about value for money and benchmarking and showing exactly what the champions have achieved is really important and definitely try and catch up with Jess about that because we've done the benchmarking exercise which is fantastic. I could then give that report to the exec and they know exactly what value they're getting out of the business. All right, But in terms of engagement, check in with them regularly. I literally have a list of all my champions and I make a point of contacting each and every one of them face to face each month if I can. I do my best just to do that. They're too busy to engage. Everybody's got a day job. How can you build in what you're asking them to do as part of their role and not an additional thing? So you can avoid that if you just give them a little bit of your time. And if they're too overwhelmed, well, why are they overwhelmed? What can you do to reduce the stress? Maybe it's not right for them. Maybe their job's pressuring them. Or maybe what you're asking them to do is way beyond and above what they're capable of doing. So ensure that you're measuring that as well. Unable to answer questions is one of the things I always get. As soon as I recruit a champion, they say to me, well, how am I going to answer technical questions? The question for you is, is it their job to do that? Maybe it isn't, but if you do want them to, what are you giving them? So I give them a Confluence page, for example. They can refer to it, or I just say direct it to my team. You don't have to answer everything. Well, don't be pressured. You can park what you've been asked and then ask me later on, and I'll answer it for you. So you just take that pressure off them just a little bit. Champions acting like police. I mean... Does anyone have an issue with champions trying to throw their weight around in their organization? I can't put my hand up because I don't. You, you, you do. Can you share your example? Do you care to do that? You rather not? <laughs> <laughs> but you can understand how power can go to someone's head. All right? So it's just important to make sure you're dealing with that from the outset. And you yourself, if you run the champions program like I do, being overwhelmed with questions... Now, if I stick my head above the parapet and put my hand up and say I want to build champions, that's part of the job, right? It's what I've signed up to. Um, but you can put things in place to help yourself. Like I said, going back to a wiki or asking your team to help you out so you don't have to be the person that they link in with all the time. Sometimes it's going to be the CISO because I'm not around. But make sure they've got someone to go to all the time if they need to contact your team. 
I think also having them, and I know this is something you do, is having them as a network where they can support each other so that they're not always coming to you with their questions. Yeah. Actually, if they're getting a question that they know someone else, another champion has had, then they can reach out to each other, communicate with each other independently of you. That can take some of the pressure off you to always be the one that, that they're coming to. Mm. And having that mesh network. So like I said, getting the guys to sit with the pen test crew, the SOC, the physical security team, get, get those relationships established so they don't have to come to you. If it's a physical issue, they go to the physical security guys and so on. It's quite simple. So before we go to questions, and I'm going to warn you, I've actually got a question for all of you as well. But before we get to that, we just want to summarize what we've been talking about today. If you are running a champions program or if you're thinking about running one, these were the key things that we wanted you to kind of take away and think about. Planning and preparation is really important. Uh, some people have spoken to me about Champions Program and they kind of think it's like a silver bullet. And it's not that at all. As Kevin said, you know, it does take hard work and it's going to take time for you to develop and turn into a success. The more you plan, the more you're able to, you know, think about the logistics of how it's going to work. The more you're able to prepare, the more successful it will be. So spend some time up front thinking about that, thinking about your organization organization, also being reali realistic about your time and how much time you are going to be able to commit to this. That's a really important thing to be honest about with yourself up front. Cool. As Kevin said, motivation, you know, how you motivate people, what the carrot's going to be, because this is not the kind of situation where a stick is going to work. Uh, you're not going to be able to really have a go at your champions, especially if they're volunteers. So you need to think about actually what can you do to keep them engaged? How can you motivate them? And actually, as Kevin said earlier, one of the most successful things with that is asking them what do they want? Why are they being a champion? So what can you do to make sure that you reward them and keep them happy. And also, how are you going to measure it? How are you going to be able to answer to the CISO or the board or whoever it might be, the rest of your team, as to whether this is actually working? Think about your metrics. And thinking about that up front means you can start measuring from the beginning. No one size fits all. So um, Kevin's been able to talk about the case study um, that he has in terms of Hargreaves Lansdowne. I've seen lots of different approaches to this. That for me is a really big benefit that no matter what organization you're dealing with, there's going to be a way of tackling this that will be successful for you. And it's a great way of scaling up, of reinforcing your efforts and of trying to positively influence the culture that you have around security. It's also a chance to listen. And this is something I mentioned in Club CISO earlier, so I, I speak a lot with CISOs, and it's something that CISOs have been increasingly saying to me. They recognize that security is no longer just about telling people what to do. That approach doesn't work. We need to listen much more than we talk, and this is a really effective way of being able to listen to the business. So they, for us, were the key points about um, what we were trying to convey in terms of the champion program. We're really happy to take questions now, but I wanted to kick it off by asking a question of all of you. So I was recently speaking to the CISO of a really large global company, and this is a company that wants to have more of a positive impact in the community around them. They're really aware of their corporate social responsibility. And as a security team, they have lots of money and they're able to do some really cool stuff. But they're aware that, you know, the area around them geographically, the organizations around them don't have the same budget that they do. So they were asking me, what can we do if we're a company with a healthy budget and we're able to do loads of cool stuff with security? What can we do to have outreach beyond this company? What can we do to actually be positive in the community? And I thought, what better than a cross-company champion program? So we always think about champions program, or I've, I've always come across them, where they've been internal to a company, um, where it's been thinking about positively influencing the security culture in that organization. But can we think about a champions program that works across companies? So we're able to actually scale up what we're trying to do. So it's not just about making one organization safer and more secure, which is, of course, a good thing. But what can we do to actually make many companies, many organizations more secure? And so I was interested whether people think that could work. 
Uh, if you think it could or it couldn't, I'd love to know your opinions on it. If you are interested in trying to develop something like that, then please do reach out. You know, either speak up now or come and find me after. Find me on Twitter, email me, whatever it is. Um, but I'd love to talk to people about maybe trying to develop something like that. So happy to take opinions, comments, questions on that or on anything that we've spoken about today. Cool. Cool. Do we have, yeah, we have a question at the front. I think there's a mic. So just kicking off and in terms of suggestions on the cross company, mm. I would imagine that cross company can work, but it might actually be better to go from the company into the community first because there's less potential conflict of interest. Yeah. That would be a thing. My, uh, uh, one question I have is, to what extent do you have, experience, uh, in your experience, has there been any problems about gating the access to the champions program? How do you deal with uh, somebody that you don't want them to be your champion <laughs> anymore? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, it's not a challenge that I've had, and I'm quite clear in my mindset and what I want to achieve. So from the day dot, everybody understands where they are. Um, so I tend to have um, quite good successes with champions. Um, I think the key thing is to set out your stall from early doors. Um, if you're not clear in terms of the agenda, I make everything formal. There's a terms of reference. Everybody knows what to expect. Okay, so this isn't just a little thing that I'm doing on the side and everybody comes for a little bit of a sandwich and a chat and a cake. That, that's not going to cut it. You know, my environment's very heavily regulated. So when I have my auditors come in, whether it's ISO, PCI, I want to demonstrate that actually we're adhering and we're very compliant by giving extra awareness training. So metrics are built in. Like I said, doing a cultural assessment to show benchmark of where you were before to where you're trying to get to. All those things should be concentrated on. And as long as there's really strong focus and you don't just onboard anybody who don't be desperate. I think if, you, if you've got four people wanting to be a champion and you're trying to get to 100, do you know what? They're going to deliver a lot more value for you with those four people. If you concentrate all your effort on them, then having a, you know the other 96 idiots in there running around. So I think it's just really important to set your stall out and be really, really clear. Yeah, I completely agree. I think this is where the preparation point is really important. You know, launching a champion program without having an idea of what you're trying to do, what you want from the champions, if it's very vague and open, that's more likely to lead to that kind of confusion about what the role looks like and people may be delivering in a way that you didn't have in mind. But if you put in the preparation at the start of this is what the role is, this is what it looks like, here's the terms of reference, do you sign up to that? You are not the police. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's the, that for me is the key thing up front. And then you find that the people who engage with that are the kind of champions that you're looking for. One last word is just to lead by example. So yeah. set the example to follow because they're doing something that you don't have a blueprint for necessarily. So it's a question. Oh, yeah. Turn the mic on, please. Just the... Perfect. That was louder than I thought. <laughs> so, um, a couple notes on the, on the firing champions. I find that certain circumstances comes up a lot more when you have informal champions that employ themselves, in my experience. <laughs> we like to uh, help the police do the purpose for you. Um, my opinion on the cross company uh, approach, the cross company awareness program, is I think you're going to face two primary barriers. Um, and I think one was touched upon briefly by someone right before me. Um, but uh, one is I would expect your small organizations are going to treat you with an extraordinary risk of very approach to an outsider looking at a business processes and sensitive intellectual capital. They don't understand the problem, so they're going to look at you as some, someone who might actually be stealing as opposed to helping. Yeah. For me, they don't have that, I think, is solved by the community thing that was mentioned. It's like, yeah. you got to get the trust first. But the other one, and uh, this is the one where I was strictly aware of saying, is most likely GDPR is going to get me away from the information. Is your externalized to you from mm -hmm. That's at least what I would think that it's an excellent initiative, but the last one is you can't, I don't see how you effectively have such a strong man management structure that you're just talking about that. In terms of reference, etc. Yeah. If you're an external entity, you've got to focus on your people, not necessarily these smaller ones. So it's a need to lose to approach it. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate it. Really good points. Thank you.
Yeah, similar points really in terms of um, sharing this sensitive information, particularly around incidents between yeah. and over cross cultural communities would be quite difficult, yeah. uh, particularly in, in sort of finance sectors and places like that. However, I do think that in particular industries, sort of third sector charity style industries, you're probably more likely to be able to engage in that space because they generally have very limited resources and they already do a lot of cross collaboration in other areas of their work. So it, it may be much more. Um, likely to get that kind of um, cross-company approach in sure. industries that already use it more effectively in this space. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That probably makes more sense, keeping it sector-specific in terms of the kind of threat landscape and everything like that. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. We have another question or comment here. I'll talk, I'll talk to them a bit. Um, I wonder if you guys had any advice around overcoming a sort of champion fatigue where maybe you were looking to implement a program or formalise it maybe more, but you found that in your company there were already champion roles, say data protection champions, health and safety, colleague engagement, social value, uh, and there was a general perception that another champion maybe wouldn't necessarily be the most successful way of driving that. Yeah, so I have come across this um, challenge in previous life. Um, so a suggestion was made. I want, well, I had my security champions and there were also risk champions. And then the fraud guys wanted to get fraud champions as well. And it's just a champion overload really, isn't it? So actually what we did is we sat down and looked at what were the, if you like, the core competencies. And actually we were able to merge the groups together. And I don't think that's going to be possible in every single organization. It just depends on the dynamics. But it is possible to have those conversations to see if you can actually get some mutual gains. So maybe try that approach. Yeah, I'm seeing that happening in another organization right now where they currently have kind of data protection champions and they're thinking about broadening that out to security. So they're having those conversations right now. Um, and I think that's all you can do is try and really discuss, well, what are the aims? What are the objectives? What are we trying to achieve here? And can we collaborate on this rather than, yeah, having a champ? Everyone's a champion for something or the same people are all champions for everything. <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments? We have another one at the front. There's a mic. That's on its way. Sorry, I don't want to overstay my welcome. Uh, uh, to what extent do, have you seen aligning champions programs with actual organizational structure for information security within uh, different business units, for example? Would you have the champion work alongside security officer in that business unit. And the other one is, uh, related to that, uh, how does this relate to a uh, DevOps type environment where you're trying to get your developers to be more secure, to, to work more securely? Yeah, so I'm gonna free plug a couple of things. Um, secure Warrior and Immersive Labs. I think those guys have really good tools in terms of engaging developers and having that language. I don't think it would be appropriate for, for um, champions necessarily, unless they're already developers and they understand um, to be chucked into what I call the lion's den, because I know what developers can be like, right? Very passionate, fantastic creatures. Um, and could you just remind me your first question again? So the first question was about uh, aligning them to organizational structure within information security, like to have security officers in the line of business. Yeah, we don't really have it in that way. So in terms of what I do at HL, I don't align it in that way because we don't have security officers in that kind of um, makeup. But like I said, what we do do, or what I have deliberately done, is I've reached out to the management per department, whether it's HR, marketing, finance, etc., and I will place um, or have nominated somebody who is interested in doing it. Because I don't think it's um, about making people do something, it's about making them want to. So a lot of my job is about selling the, the role to them and trying to align it to exactly what they're doing in that discipline, whether it is finance or marketing, if that makes sense. Yeah. On that note, I think we're out of time. So I just want to thank you all. Thanks to Kevin. Thank you, Jess. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking to you all. Thanks for your time. Thanks for thank your you attention. All.